So this is supposed to be pedagogical. So I'm not going to give any references. Because if I start getting into who did what and where, and the presentation will not be in a historical presentation, we will not get much. So I really think I should focus on the concepts and tell a story. And the correct historical order, it's not in the correct historical order, and there would be no references. And references can be found in a series of papers I wrote over the last two years, and there are tons of references there. And the way, so now I'm going to start. And it's always a good idea in physics to have toy models which are as simple as possible that exhibit a subtle phenomenon. And it's often the case that when we study especially very complicated phenomena, anomalies, and so forth, the, there's a lot of confusion, partly because they were encountered for the first time in complicated setups with a lot, with many, many moving parts, and it's hard to see what's essential and what's not. So the first example I would study, I'll study a sequence of examples, a, two specific examples at the beginning of this lecture, which demonstrates various phenomena of anomalies. And to make it as simple as possible, I would like to get out of the way two things that are often taught. When I learned about anomalies, I always learned that anomalies are something associated with fermions. Theories of bosons don't have anomalies, or at least theories of non-chiral bosons don't have anomalies, number one. Number two, anomalies are associated with the fact that in quantum field theory, we have an infinite number of degrees of freedom, so we need to regularize, and the whole thing comes from the regularization. So what I'm going to do is to start with a very simple quantum mechanical system. It's almost the simplest quantum mechanical system you can think about. And it exhibits many of the phenomena that we will see later in the talks, except that the setting will be so simple and so trivial that there is really no room to be confused. And there will be no fermions, no infinite number of degrees of freedom, and all the other complications. So the system I'm going to study is a quantum mechanical system of a particle on a circle. And I need to write the Lagrangian. The Lagrangian is a q dot square. And I can also add another term, sorry, 1 over 2 pi, theta q dot. So this is a particle on a circle. And the physical interpretation of this theta it can be thought of as magnetic flux through the surface. There are other ways to interpret it. And it has the property that classically, I'm using Lorentzian signature for this part of the talk. Classically, this term doesn't do anything. It does not affect the equations of motion. And the particle just freely moves with constant velocity around the circle. These are the solutions of the classical equations of motion. But quantum mechanically, this term is important. This is my pi. Well, mechanically, this term is important. And one way to see that is to let time to be Euclidean, compactify Euclidean time on a circle. And then the functional integral is over configurations where we map from space time, which is a circle at this point, to the target space, which is a circle. I'm going to identify here. Q is identified with Q plus 2 pi. This is a circle. And these maps are characterized by an integer winding number, how many times we go around the circle. That's an integer. So the integral over Euclidean time of q dot is there's some two pi's and there's an integer here. And therefore, physics is periodic in this theta. So this is the very much like the theta parameter of, say, four-dimensional QCD, or we'll also see examples of theta in other dimensions later in the talk. But theta is the same as theta plus two pi. And the in instant on number or winding number is an integer, 1 over 2 pi, an integral is pi, the integral of q dot in Euclidean space. And that's an integer. So let's solve this problem the old fashioned way. So there's a recipe in textbooks how to solve such systems. You have to find the momentum pi of q, we take the Lagrangian and we differentiate with respect to q dot. So this is q dot plus 1 over 2 pi theta. 
And then we can find the Hamiltonian, which is a half, IQ minus 1 over 2 pi theta square. Who has not seen this before? Who has seen this before? Good. I'm very happy that some people heard it before. So now we diagonalize the Hamiltonian. How do we diagonalize the Hamiltonian? We write that in some coordinate representation, and we write a half minus i d by dq minus 1 over 2 pi theta square. That's the Hamiltonian. That acts on the wave function, the nth state, not the same as this n. That has energy e n times the wave function psi n. And that's easy to solve. The wave function psi n is q with the state n. It's 1 over square root of 2 pi e to the i n q. And the corresponding energy is 1 half n minus theta over 2 pi square. And I'm sure that most of you have already seen everything I said so far. Now, let's discuss theta versus theta plus 2 pi. Theta is the same as theta plus 2 pi. And one way to see that is that there is a similarity transformation on the system. We multiply the similarity transformations by e to the iq. So if we conjugate the Hamiltonian with the operator e to the iq, it maps the Hamiltonian at theta to the Hamiltonian at theta plus 2 pi. And therefore, this thing acts on the Hilbert space. It maps the Hilbert space, and we map theta to theta plus 2 pi. And therefore, we have that symmetry. We therefore, we can restrict attention to theta between 0 and 2 pi. What are the symmetries of the problem? First of all, we have a U1 symmetry that maps Q to Q plus alpha. Right? The target space is a circle, so we can rotate the circle by an arbitrary amount, and that's a global U1 symmetry. We can also consider a Z2 symmetry, which we can call charge conjugation, that maps Q to minus Q. So instead of having the circle with this orientation, we reverse the orientation of the circle. These two groups together form the group known as O2, because U1 is the same as SO2. And they are generated by an operator O alpha, and this is operator O C, C for charge conjugation. Ah, the Lagrangian is invariant when theta is zero. So these are operations, and then let's check whether these are symmetries or not. Thank you for asking the question. So if theta equals zero, L is O2 invariant. And the spectrum is in representations of O2. The ground state has n equals 0. And then we have representations. So the spectrum has the state n equals 0. Then we have the state n equals plus 1. And the state n equals minus 1. They have the same energy. And then we have more. And all of them are in representations of O2 as they should be. Generic theta, this is a symmetry, but this is not a symmetry. As you can see from the Lagrangian, if I flip the sign of Q, this is invariant. But here, it's not a symmetry because it flips the sign of theta. However, the point theta equals pi is very interesting because at theta equals pi, U1 is a symmetry. That's OK. But the Z2 is also a symmetry. Because if I flip the sign of Q, of Q, I get a minus sign here. I get a minus sign here. It flips the sign of theta. And theta equals pi. We've already said it's the same as state as theta equals minus pi. And therefore, this should also be a symmetry there. But let's analyze that in more detail.
we need to understand how the symmetry acts in the various cases. So for theta equals pi, for theta equals zero, we've already said that the symmetry, so u1, here u1 maps the state n goes to e to the i alpha n times the state n, that's the u1, and the z2 maps the state n to the state minus n. And indeed, they are symmetric. For theta equals pi, that's not true. In fact, we can plot the various energy states as a function of theta. So at theta equals zero, there's one state here, and then there are various states like that. And the energy states are on parabolas. You might be able to plot it well. And at theta equals two pi, this is two pi, there's one state here and two states here, etc. The same, exactly the same as at zero. But at pi, we see that we have two states here. There are two degenerate states in the ground state. So as we move theta by two pi, we st the spectrum becomes the same, but these are not the same states. The states are reshuffled. But the spectrum is mapped to itself. So let's see how at theta equals pi, how the various generators act. So O alpha, we've already said, it maps Q to Q plus alpha, and it maps the state n to e to the i alpha n times n. This is the rotation with an arbitrary, with, by an arbitrary amount. OC should map q to minus q, and it's easy to see that it maps n to minus n plus one. These two states indeed have the same energy at theta equals pi because we worked out the energies here. In fact, I didn't write it down. The n, sorry about that, is one half n minus theta over two pi square. And you can check that the theta equals pi, this is a half, and these two states have the generate energies. These two states have the same energy. This is how this generator acts. And just by looking at, the, at Q, one might think that they form an O2, right? Because one of them shifts Q by a little bit, and the other flips the direction of, flips the value of Q. But it's easy to see that that's not true. We can act with OC, O alpha, on the state N. So if we first act with O alpha and then with OC, then it goes to E to the I alpha N minus n plus one. But if we work with the opposite order, goes to e to the i alpha minus n plus one on the state minus n plus one. This means that they don't generate O2. The action on Q, on the coordinate, is O2, but the action on the states is not O2. So, but before we analyze it, I should say that this is not something you should be surprised by. You shouldn't be surprised because this is something that already Mr. Bigner knew. When we have a classical system with a symmetry, the quantum system might represent the system the symmetry projectively. So symmetries in quantum mechanics are not, do not act in a simple way on the Hilbert space, but they act, they might act projectively. And there are various ways to understand that. And what I'm going to do is demonstrate it in this system. This system is so simple that there's really no room for I'm going to do, I'm going to derive this thing. I'm going to give six different, oh no, not quite six, but many different interpretations of this phenomenon. Different interpretations that will connect to many different things that we'll be discussing later. But there isn't much you can do. I, this is a well-defined action, this is a well-defined action, and you can just ask and you can just compute it. You can almost do it in real time.
So what should we do about it? Uh, one option is to include another generator in the symmetry, I beta, which simply acts as is central. And when it acts on the state N, it gives us E to the I beta N. That's not a very exciting operator. It's central. It commutes with all the operators in the theory. And when we act on the Hilbert space, it mul multiplies the entire Hilbert space by an arbitrary phase. And that phase is going to drop out in all correlation functions, and that's why this is not an exciting thing to do. However, it fixes the problem that we had before, because OC, O alpha, OC, that should have been O minus alpha, but it's not. It is this I at the value alpha. This is the central extension. Right, in O2, this is one, but this relation is modified, and this is a central extension of the O2 algebra, and there is an I alpha here. There's another way to, do, to deal with that, and to say that we define another operator, V alpha, which is this I alpha over two, and we need a minus sign, times O alpha, and then these V alpha satisfy OC V alpha OC equals V of minus alpha. That's nice. That looks like O2. We got an O2. So what's wrong with that? Can anybody tell me what's wrong with that? Why didn't I say that, okay, the symmetry is O2. Why, why, why did I tell you all that before? What's wrong with this? What's wrong with it is that I put my alpha over 2 here. And therefore, originally, in O alpha, alpha was between 0 and 2 pi. Because we rotate the circle. In V alpha, alpha is between 0 and 4 pi. So this group is accidentally also O2, but it's from the point of view of the rotation group, we had to go to the double cover of the rotation group. So the central, so the algebra, the, the group that we had, is extended by a central element, and the central element is P, which is this I, what was my notation? I of pi, which is the same as V with two pi. So with O, O sub two pi is the same as O zero, but with V, V of two pi is a non-trivial element. We think of this as being rotation, it's the difference between the orthogonal group and the spin group. So what we have to do here is go to the double cover of the rotation group, which is the, the spin group. There's a more modern way of thinking about it. And in a more modern way of thinking about it, whenever we see a global symmetry, the first thing you should do is couple the system to background fields for that symmetry. So it's usually a good idea when you have a coupling constant to think of it as a field, one second. And if you have a global symmetry, so what does it mean that you have a global symmetry? We can couple the system to some background gauge field for that system and study it as a function or functional of this gauge field. Question. For S, there's a, or, for speed, for SON, for any N, there is a double cover, which is the spin N. You see, spinner, there's no, there are no spinners in SON. The, the spinner is a representation of the double cover of SON. In SON, if you go to make a two pi rotation, you come back to yourself. In spin N, you don't come back to yourself, you come back to yourself and you do a four pi. I describe it as an anomaly. What we see here is an anomaly, but I'm building toward that. I first did kind of look just at the Hilbert space. We solved the system. And after we solved the system, we showed that one way of thinking about it is that the system is, the symmetry is realized objectively. Then I said, instead of saying that the symmetry is realized projectively, we go to the double cover, and then the system is not realized. And we have a standard representation of the symmetry, but the symmetry is the double cover.
hard for me to speak soft. I think it's a microphone. This is the only question I cannot answer. Is it better now? I'm not comfortable, but that's okay. So we need to couple the system to a U1 gauge field. So let's couple the system to a U1 gauge field. And there is a recipe for this. So I'm take, starting with the same Lagrangian we had before, which was over there. And so there's one over two. We had a Q dot. And what we do is we add to it A0. Let me check the sign. Yep, that's the sign I can get. And then we had the term with theta. Now the Lagrangian is gauge invariant, because if we're performing a gauge transformation on the parameter alpha, so we let alpha depend on time, we can compensate for it by shifting A by the derivative of alpha with respect to time. Also, at that point, we can add another term to the Lagrangian, k, times A0. And the coefficient k should better be quantized, because, whoops, because if I have closed loops, I have closed loops. I would like that under gauge transformation, the thing comes back to itself, even gauge transformation that wind around the circle. Okay, so that's good. Now we have a Lagrangian, which is gauge invariant. However, now it's manifestly true that the system, some things that we said before are no longer true. In particular, let us compare theta equals theta and theta plus two pi. So this is the same. Here, when we shift theta by 2 pi, the contribution from q dot doesn't change, but we shift the Lagrangian by 2 pi over 2 pi times a naught. So the Lagrangian is not invariant. So once we couple it to background fields, the theory at theta is not the same as the theory at theta plus 2 pi. However, if we remember that we can allow this term, then the system at theta in k is the same as theta plus 2 pi and k minus 1. So we still have symmetry under shifting, we have invariance under shifting theta by 2 pi, but when we do that, we also have to shift the coefficient of this term. Is this clear? This is elementary algebra. So this is identified with that. So if we have non-zero a, if we have zero a, we don't see all that. But if we have non-zero A, which is what we need to do if we want to explore the symmetry, we see that the per theta periodicity is true only if we also shift K by one. Otherwise, we don't have the periodicity. Uh, we'll soon get to the interpretation of K. We'll soon get to it. I'm, I'm going to answer precisely this question. In fact, let's, why don't I do it now? One of the advantages of uh, adding gauge fields is that we can see what's the current, what's the charge that the symmetry couples to. What's the U1 charge? The U1 charge is obtained by taking the derivative with respect to A. So the derivative with respect to A, and then substituting A equals zero, is Q dot from here, plus theta over two pi from here, plus so the U1 charge, this picture, is the piece that we would naively write down, plus another contribution, K, from here. So the whole charge of we shift, K tells us, we say that the charge is not the naive one, we shift it by one, by K units. Independent of anything else, kind of the entire Hilbert space shifts by K units. Excellent question. So if we shift by, by S, so it goes to K, the derivative is D, zero of alpha, it's a total derivative. It's a total derivative, so it does not affect the local thing, but we have to make sure that it's closed correctly because alpha is a periodic variable. So that would be the integral of that, would be k alpha c of zero plus minus alpha of two pi minus alpha of zero, I mean Euclidean time here. So that could be an arbitrary integer multiple of two pi. So that could be k times 2 pi times another integer, m, and that should be a multiple of 2 pi in order not to affect the action, and therefore k has to be quantized. 
this k can be thought of, this last term can be thought of as a churn simuls term, but in one dimension. A very degenerate case of the churn simuls term, this coefficient is a, has to be quantized. To understand better what we're doing here, let us turn on, go to really to Euclidean space, and turn on in Euclidean space an integral of A to U to be the integral of A. And we should remember that this should be identified with mu plus 2 pi. That means that we put background A in our circle, around the circle, and the background A is characterized by this holonomy mu, which is periodic. Right? The only thing which is meaningful is e to the i, the integral of A. So let's compute the partition function in that, thing, in that case. As Nima said, this is a Gaussian model, so we just do it. Except this is so simple, we've already diagonalized the Hamiltonian. We know the energies of all the states. And I'm just computing the partition function. So we have two states. We, the two states here, which are the generate, have n equals 0 and n equals 1. So I get the contribution from here, and it is 1 plus e to the i mu, and that multiplied by the contribution of their energy, which is one-eighth in our unit, and then the dot, dot, dot from the higher energy states, which are not going to change what I'm going to say. So, you see, the naive, the charge comes from here. Uh, I just erased it. The states essentially have charge n, because uh, that's how we, we yeah, you read off the charge from here. And the charge in this mu appears as a chemical potential for the global U1 symmetry. And there are two states at the ground state, n equals 0 and n equals 1, that give us these two contributions. And that's their energy, and then there are higher energy states. And what we see here at z of mu, if there was a z2 symmetry, would have been z of minus mu. But instead, there's a factor of e to the minus i mu. So the partition function is not invariant under the charge conjugation symmetry, which is not surprising because in order to achieve the charge conjugation symmetry at theta equals phi, we had to shift k. And shifting k is like having a different system. We couple the system. The system has a global symmetry. It clearly has the global symmetry. But when we couple it to background fields, the answer is not a function of the background field because there's a prefactor that we need to insert. So what do we do about it? Yes. Because I thought the system has an O2 symmetry. So if I take put the holonomy associated with mu, and the O2 tells, maps, the Z2 in O2 maps mu to minus mu. So the partition function at mu should be the same as the partition function at minus mu. And they're not the same. They differ by this prefactor. And this prefactor is nothing but the fact that we have to shift k. So all, all these things are related. So the fact that we get this prefactor means that when we're doing the charge conjugation symmetry, we flip the sign of q. In order for that to be a symmetry, we also have to, to shift the coefficient of this k. So if we set a to 0, we don't see that. So from u equals 0, we don't see that. Oh. Well, that's exactly what I'm analyzing. I'm analyzing whether the symmetry is there in the, when I turn on background fields. So without background fields, there's an O2 symmetry. That was clearly a symmetry of Classically, this whole thing is, is absent because classically there is no theta. Theta has an effect only in the quantum theory, not in the classical one. No, for, for, no classically there is O2 for any theta. Theta doesn't play a role, so set it to zero, it doesn't matter. So this is a very quantum effect. 
but it's not a very subtle effect because after all, you know, like it's all, all the algebra is in front of your eyes. So there are various things we can say about this thing. For one thing, we can just redefine what we mean and call it z hat in such a way that we'll absorb this mu over there, and we are going to write that as e to the minus i mu over 2 plus e to the plus i mu over 2, and then it would be z hat uh, times, sorry, times e to the minus beta over 8 plus dot, dot, dot. In other words, we say that the two ground states, the two ground states do not have charge 0 and 1. So what did we do here? In hindsight, it's completely trivial. We have two states here. One of them has n equals 0 and the other has n equals 1. So we, say we have two states. They have charges 0 and 1. It's obvious that the system is not O2 invariant. But the system is O2 invariant. The charges have to flip sign. That, that's what the O2 means. So what we can say is let's shift what we mean by the charge and say that these two guys have charges plus and minus a half. Just one second. They have charges plus or minus a half. This amounts to redefining the partition function like that. And then the partition function will be an even function of mu. The price we pay for that is that the states have charges plus and minus a half. And this is not a good representation of O2 with the normalization that we use. This is a way of seeing the central extension. So one way of saying is that the states have charges plus and minus a half. We go to the double cover. The, symmetry, the charges are plus and minus a half. That's not a representation of O2, but that's likely. There's nothing we can do about it. I'm going to show soon another interpretation. It was a question. You said that as we change k, we change the system, right? Means or change the theory. So is that change like a continuous, or k can take only discrete values, which characterizes k? K has to be an integer. Has to be an integer. K has to be an integer. So for different integers, we have like discrete, like set of. Uh, it's a different Lagrangian. The, you don't see that for correlation function. So imagine you compute correlation function, expectation values of operators. As long as operators are not in the, so you could have said everything with setting a to zero. And, and OK, and we just study correlation functions of operators. We could have done that. Then the correlation functions are always, will, the operators are, are in O2 representations. We have this uh, phenomenon that you're talking about here. And where will K enter? K will enter in the choice of contact term when two operators are on top of each other. So in the last talk, we heard about a correlation functions in a conformal field theory. He did not say, where is he? He skipped my talk. The, he did not say that everything he said is true when operators are not on top of each other. When operators are on top of each other, this whole data of the bootstrap doesn't determine what happens. And you have to, impo you have to impose more consistency conditions. And, the more co the, and sometimes there's freedom in that. And this K is a freedom in the choice of contact. What will be a description? K is not a dynamical thing. K is a number. Yeah, I mean, it's, not dynamical. it's part of how you define the theory. It's part of the definition of the theory. You have to say what K is. But that will enter either. So if A is 0, you say, oh, it doesn't affect anything. It will affect what happens when two operators are on top of each other. And with the, and if you turn on background A, it will just appear in the partition function, as we have just seen. N, is, N labels the states. So I, I don't change the label of the states. I'm just changing what, I, what charge I assign to the states. Say so that these two states, which are labeled by N equals zero, and I, whatever I see charge, I shift it to half. So I take the whole Hilbert space, and I had the definition of the charge. I say, what you thought it is, that the charge is N, and shift N by a half. In fact, that's exactly the definition we did here. We shift the charges by a half. For the entire Hilbert space. Sorry, that. Well, that's this is this is v. V does exactly that. But now the charges are all half integer. All the states in the spectrum have half integer charges. Half integer, I mean half integers which are not integers. One thirds, 
well, sorry, one half, three halves, five halves, but there would not be a seven. This is only theta equals pi. For integer theta, for theta multiple of two pi, this story is, this doesn't arise. Or in other words, theta equals, say, two pi, I can repeat all that, I can redefine by charges, but I still do that with integers, so there is no problem. If theta equals pi, there is a problem. For generic theta, we don't have the symmetry, so I don't have to answer the question. Yeah, that's, that's the part in there. Right, so the, the... But you say it's, it's compact. I mean, same thing. Oh, oh I, I see. The correlation function at zero momentum. Uh, okay. The correlation function at zero momentum is a contact term in position space. There's a more modern way of saying it. So what did we do here? We, can't, we have this tension. Either we have preserved the U1 with its periodicity, or we preserve charge conjugation. And we could have tried to fix that by putting this thing, but then that's not good. Equivalently, I could say, imagine that K here, I could have put a half in K. If I put a half in K, that would have been good enough. This is the same as the shift I did here. So let's check, let's change that and map our Lagrangian to the Lagrangian plus one half A zero. So somebody should complain because I've asked earlier that the coefficient of A zero must be an integer. So now it's not an integer. So that's not a good idea, but it's all, it is a step in the right direction because instead of doing that, I said that the action I have is an integral d tau of the Lagrangian, that's in the in Euclidean space. And then I wanted to add to it a half the integral of a. I can't do that, that's not meaningful. But let's assume that this is S1. We extend S1 to be the boundary of a two manifold. So M is a two manifold. M is a two manifold, which has a boundary, a circle. Could be very complicated, could be a disk, or it could have some handles, be quite complicated. And we extend S1 to be M2. And then I write that not as an integral of A, as an integral of dA. So I've changed my problem. So here is our circle. And I'm adding an M2. This is our S1. This is our space time. Now I make believe that my space time is more complicated. It's this. But the dynamics takes place only on the boundary. Q lives only on the boundary. So nothing fluctuates in the bulk. So the bulk is completely classical, but the boundary is dynamical. You have a Q that, that runs here and fluctuates quantum mechanically. And I extend A to the bulk. And now I have shifted it. And in the new presentation, the system has the full O2 symmetry. Now I have the full O2 symmetry with the original periodicity, but I pay a penalty. What's the penalty? The penalty is the result of the functional integral depends on the extension. You and I decide to take different two manifolds here. We'll keep the same two manifold and put different A's there. We are going to get different answers for the problem. So the partition function is now depends on this mu, and it has all the right periodicity, everything is nice, but it depends on more data. And the more data, one way to see that, is to say that you had an M2, and I had an M2 prime with the same boundary, so I can glue M2 prime to this M. So now I have a close two manifold together, and the closed two manifold doesn't have a boundary. And for the answer to be independent of what I do in the bulk, the difference should be, uh, should be in, in, invisible. But instead, what I get is the difference between them is an integral, let's call this whole thing M. So we have the integral of M of dA, and that could be plus or minus one. So the whole thing is in the sign of the partition function. So the price we pay is that the partition function is an ill-defined sign. 
And if we specify the extension to the bulk, that determines the sign. But and that solves all our problems. But the answer is not well defined. It depends on more data. It's important that it's plus or minus sign, that it is invariant under the Z2 that flips the sign of A. So what do we do? We preserve the, all the symmetries. But the answer depends on more data. And now everything works great. That's a typical thing of anomalies. We have a global symmetry. It is satisfied correlation functions at separated points, not at coincident points. Therefore, we cannot, we, when we try to couple the system to background fields, what happens at coincident points becomes important. And then we have, this, the correlation functions are now not, not invariant. And if we turn on background fields, the answer is not invariant. But we still get away with it if we add this extension to the bulk. And the extension of the bulk tells us that the physical system depends on additional data. And with this additional data, we satisfy all the symmetries. In the modern term, there are various names for this phenomenon. It's called anomaly inflow. It's called a topological insulator. There are all sorts of other names for it. But that would be something that will come again and again in these talks. With symmetry, the symmetry is a good symmetry. It suffers from this anomaly. Technically, I would refer to it as a tooth anomaly. I'll later say more about the different anomalies that we study. And the way to think of the tooth anomaly is, by, is to add a bulk. And then we need to specify more information in the bulk. Question. Because the integral of dA on every closed manifold, on every closed manifold, is always an integer m times 2 pi. So. Number of fluxes, units of flux that we can put there, called the first strand class. Mm, because I was wrong, because I cop forgot to copy the a half. Thank you. Now everything is good. It's the same a half that I put here, and the same a half that appeared here. Thank you. Sorry. It could be any integer. So when I, you and I specify what M is, M2 is, and you and I pick some background A, our answers will differ, will have different integer. So most of the information in this extension to the bulk is not important. And even if there is an integer M, most of the information in this M is not important. But if you chose even M and I chose odd M, well, M is really well defined only when the manifold is closed. But we can put a local instanton around some cycle. So you and I will differ by one instanton there. So A will differ by one, and that will change the sign of the partition function. And we will both be correct, because the answer is not unique. The answer has this intrinsic ambiguity. And that's the anomaly. Let me move to another example, which is the, there is a well-defined partition function if I sacrifice something. I'll have to sacrifice something. So option one, I sacrifice charge conjugation. Then I get a good answer. This answer. This answer sacrifice charge conjugation. Another thing I could do is say, I sacrifice, I, I, I want to keep charge conjugation is very important for me. But the periodicity of the U1, I don't like that very much. Then this is the correct answer. The third option is no, both of them are, are very important. I need to, want to have the U1 with the correct periodicity. I want to have the charge conjugation symmetry with the correct action. Then something will have to give. And the option is to add the bulk. And then the answer depends on what happens in the bulk. Notice the whole thing is just in, see, what's wrong with this? What's wrong with this is that mu and mu plus 2 pi don't give us the same answer. Right? They differ by a sign. It's the same sign. We just move the sign from one place to another. They are not the same theory. They're not the same theory. So if you study correlation functions at separated points, oh, here he is. Why did you hide before? <laughs> so when you study correlation functions at separated points, you don't see all these subtleties. But when they're on top of each other, or you could study these metrics elements and all that, then these things come 
particular, but if you, so if you study the system as a, as a function of the background fields, that's important. So going up in dimensions, I would like to tell a story in two dimensions. So section two. It is, a, it is exactly this. It's not similar. It, this is it. But this is a very simple version of, yeah, because everything is so, the thing, the nice thing here is that the system is completely solvable. Well, there are other such solvable systems with anomalies, and you can see everything with the naked eye, rather than some more complicated formalism. I want to get all the signs straight. So, section two, it's the 2D, CP, N minus one model. And one way to think about it is that we have complex field ZI, I runs from one to N, constrained to satisfy equals one. So we start from that, that gives us a sphere, a 2N, two N minus one dimensional sphere, but we also gauge the U1 symmetry. So we say that the kinetic term I here doesn't matter. Square. Sorry? Ah, sure, thank you. This i is square root of minus one, and this i is a label that runs from one to n, and I hope you will not be confused by it. Okay, so we have, we gauge a, a U1 symmetry. So this is a system of n scalar fields constrained to satisfy this equation, and they're complex, and they're coupled to a gauge field. And we can add to it theta over two pi, let me call it A, the A. This is a theta term in two dimensions, whose role is very similar to the theta term we had before. And there's huge literature on this system. Most of it is irrelevant to what I'm going to say here. What I'm going to say would be so simple and qualitative that we don't need the huge literature on the subject. As before, theta is identified with theta plus two pi because the integral of this is always a multiple of two pi. Integral, so if I shift theta by two pi, I have an integral dA, it's the same thing I had before. Except that now we are in two dimensions other than one dimension. So space time is two dimension and A is a dynamical field. Before it was a classical. Throughout these lectures, uppercase is classical, lowercase is dynamical. So that would be the convention. Every uppercase object is a classical field. I don't integrate over it. And lowercase would be dynamical that I integrate over. What's the global symmetry of the system? So let's first do the continuous one. There might be some charge conjugation and time reversal. We'll discuss them. But for the moment, let's just discuss the, globe, the continuous symmetry. So there's an SUN symmetry that rotates the different Zs. It could have also be a U1, we multiply them by an arbitrary unitary matrix, but that U1 is gauge, so we shouldn't count it. This is not quite right. Why isn't it quite right? Because if we try to form gauge invariant observables out of the Zs, we are going to have some Zs and derivatives of Z, and maybe some Z star, etc. The number of Zs have to be the same, has to be the same as the number of Z stars. That's for gauge invariant. And therefore, when we ask what kind of representation of SUN can we get, we're only get, going to get representations which are invariant under the center of SUN. So if, say, N is 2, we're going to get PSU2, which is the same as SO3. If, it's SU, if N is 3, we're going to have PSU3, which is SU3 mod ZN. So this is the symmetry group. It's a 
PSUNF, PSUN, which is a quotient. Not all possible representations of SUN appear. So SUN is not realized faithfully on the Hilbert space, but PSUN is realized faithfully on, on the operators, not on the Hilbert space. So the operators, all the gauge invariant operators, all the local operators in the theory are in faithful representations of PSUN, not projective representations of PSUN, but actual representation of PSUN. We don't have any operator which is in the fundamental of SUN. Because if I try, I'll, I'll say it in several different ways because that's an important point. Imagine I try to construct the gauge invariant operators out of the Z's. U1 gauge invariance. This is a gauge invariant, this is a U1 field. Another way of saying it is that imagine we're performing an SUN transformation on the fields. That's a global symmetry. It leaves the Lagrangian invariant. But the center of SUN acts the same as a gauge transformation in the U1. So the center of SUN is really part of the gauge group. And therefore, it's not a separate symmetry. It does not act on gauge invariant things. That's another way of saying why the symmetry is PSUN rather than SUN. Now let us try and make that more precise and try and couple the system to a gauge field for this thing. How should we do that? We consider A, which is a UN gauge field. But most of it is going to be classical, and only a tiny piece of it is going to be dynamical. So in favorable situations, I can write A as what I called A before, times the unit matrix, plus a matrix A of SUN. But this does not cover all possibilities. There are background configurations for SUN gauge fields, which are so for this gauge field here, which are not SUN gauge fields, but PSUN gauge fields. We emphasize that the global symmetry, the correct global symmetry is PSUN, not SUN. So we can put the system in a background field of this SUN, of this big A, which is not an SUN field. In that case, we do not have such a simple decomposition, but we can still use that UN gauge field. Okay, so let's write the problem with this big A, this curly A. So we still have the sum over A and I and all that. So this becomes D plus I this big A, curly A, and this Z. Z is now a vector, absolute value square. And we need to write the theta term. So we write theta over 2 pi. And now we have to put the 1 over n here times uh, the field strength trace of D. And the hero of our story is this n in the denominator. What this means is that the system is no longer invariant under theta goes to theta plus 2 pi. It's only invariant under theta goes to 2 pi times n. So if we go n steps, we come back to ourselves. But if we go just with one step, we don't go back to ourselves. So in general, if theta equals 2 pi times k, the Lagrangian is, this term becomes k over n raised the a. This is the term in the action. And that can be written as 2 pi k over n. The integral, if you're a little bit more sophisticated, of the stiffel whitney class of PSUN or of the PSUN bundle that we have. Second stiffel class. If you didn't understand that comment, then ignore it. 
I would like to give a physical picture of this. When you first study this system, or you study electrodynamics in two dimensions, we say that theta is identified with theta plus 2 pi. And the reason for that is that theta can be thought of as a background electric field. The system has background electric field throughout all of space. And if we make this field too large, the system, what the system does is to pair create these z quanta, send them to infinity, and screen the field by 2 pi. So we start with theta equals zero, we make it bigger and bigger. Once we are beyond pi, the system creates a pair, sends one of them over there, one of them over there. They screen the charge and bring the charge theta down by 2 pi. So this is the mechanism physically why we have this periodicity by 2 pi. And if we are in infinite space, this is a correct statement. We send this pair to infinity, we forget about it, we stay around here, we don't see any difference. So theta and theta plus 2 pi is, are the same. But imagine our system has a boundary. If our system has a boundary, and we crank theta up by 2 pi, as we crank it up, we have this pair, and this pair runs to the boundary, and we have one z quantum here and one z quantum there. So the system with theta, this is our space, is the same as theta plus 2 pi. So we crank theta to theta plus 2 pi. And that is, becomes, after the z creation, a z particle here, z stark particle here, and back theta over here. This is this screening the charge. But now we see what happens. We said before that the system does not have an SUN symmetry. All the operators are in representations of PSUA. But this guy, this is true for the entire system. The entire system is still in the PSUN representation. But we have a fundamental here and an anti-fundamental here. So this system, to view the whole system, it's still OK. It's still in the, in the representation of PSUN. But we have fundamental here and an anti-fundamental there. So if we live here near the boundary, it says, what are you talking about PSUN? I have a particle in the fundamental of SUN sitting here. The system also has a particle in the anti-fundamental, but it is very far. It's near the other boundary. So that means that the system at theta and the system at theta plus 2 pi are almost the same. If we are here in the bulk, so I'm here in this one-dimensional space, and I'm doing experiments here, I can't tell the difference between theta and theta plus 2 pi. But on the boundary, I see a difference, and the difference is this extra particle. There are more sophisticated ways of seeing it also in the bulk, but let's not get into it. No, for theta equals zero, we just see that theta equals zero. So for every one of these, so the system as before is labeled by theta. Either we say that it's labeled by theta running from zero to two pi in, or we say it's a periodic theta, but we also have to keep track of an integer, how many z's we have at infinity. Uh, the complete characterization of the system is the set of two numbers theta between 0 and 2 pi, and this integer, very much like what we had here, that we had to keep track of theta between 0 and 2 pi, and another integer k. So the same thing is true here. It wasn't presented in this form, but that was a recent Nobel Prize. This fact that, that theta equals 2 pi, 2 pi is not the same as 0, and that's called, it has various names. We think the earliest version of that was found by Duncan Holding, and he got the prize for it. And it comes under different names depending on the physical application of this system. Already gone over time. Is that right? Oh, no, I still have, oh, it runs backwards. Ah, wonderful, wonderful. So this is, this is just kinematics. We haven't done any dynamics here. This is just kinematics. And 
dynamically, what is believed to happen, and in some range of parameters it can be proven rigorously, and there's a lot of evidence that it's true, is that for generic n, this system is gapped. And for n equals 2, which is the CP1 model, it's generically gapped for generic theta, but the theta equals pi, the system is gapless, and there is a conformal field theory there, very much like the conformal field theories that we heard about before, except that it's in two dimensions. And it's known what the conformal field theory is. So that's what the, the system does. But that also means that something peculiar has to happen at theta equals pi. Theta equals pi is a very interesting case, because at theta equals pi, this system also has another symmetry, which you can think of as time reversal or charge conjugation, because we flip the sign of this A. This is charge conjugation. Or we can also flip the direction of time and not change the sign of A. Either way, the system has another symmetry, another Z2, only at theta equals zero and pi. At theta equals zero, the symmetry is manifest. At theta equals pi, it's very much like what we had before. At theta equals pi, this is not a true symmetry of the system unless we use the identification of theta with theta plus two pi. But that identification suffers from this anomaly, and therefore we have what is known as a toothed anomaly. What we've been doing here in this lecture is kinematic. I don't care what the dynamic does. This is still true. This is, this is kind of the kinematics of the problem. There's nothing we can do about it. So this is the physics at short distances, and we found that at theta equals pi, we have all these subtleties, and we don't have charge conjugation. Something at long distances would will have to reproduce these subtleties. This is known as a toothed anomaly matching. So the long distance observer says, I don't see any CPN degrees of freedom. I don't see all that. That happens at high energies. But I should be able to see at long distances that theta is not the same as theta plus 2 pi. And the way it comes about is that for generic n, for generic n, so n bigger than 2, n bigger than 2, for n bigger than 2, the system is gapped with the first order transition And at that first order transition, C or T is spontaneously broken. So the system has two ground states. The system is spontaneously broken. And this is how it gets out of this conflict that time reversal has to use the shift of theta, which is not quite an allowed operation because of all this business. For n equals 2, there's a CFT there. And that CFT realizes the same subtlety, the same at truth phenomenon. What this discussion tells us, that you could say, I'm not interested in what happens very far. You sent these z particles to infinity, I couldn't care less, I'm doing local physics here, I don't want to hear about that, which is good, good attitude. But you're going to miss the fact that something will have to give at theta equals pi. So something will have to happen at theta equals pi to account for this subtlety. And that means that if you have a symmetry, either the symmetry is spontaneously broken, or there are some excitations, some long range order at theta equals pi that accounts for that subtlety. So this is the end of section two. I move. Yes. Okay. So that that's a good place to refer to do that because the word anomaly is maximally confusing in the literature for historical reasons, and because the anomaly appeared in different places and people didn't understand what is what. The first kind of anomaly is that you have a gauge symmetry, and it appears in you have a computer triangle diagram in four dimensions or a bubble in two dimensions for continuous symmetry. And that means that the gauge symmetry is ruined, and gauge symmetry is very important, 
shouldn't be ruined, and therefore such systems are inconsistent. So an anomaly in the gauge symmetry is an inconsistent phenomenon, makes the theory inconsistent. That's number one. The second anomaly, you compute the same thing, but the interpretation is different. You compute it, for example, in four dimension, a global symmetry current in two gauge fields. That appeared in the pi zero decay or in the U1 problem in four dimensions. What that means is that the global symmetry is not conserved. You would think it is conserved, classically it is conserved, but quantum mechanically it's not conserved. That's called adler belcher keeve anomaly. And they use the same anomaly because you do the same computation, but since what you put in the external legs are global currents rather than a dynamical gauge field, the interpretation is different. The third kind of anomaly is you put three global currents in four dimensions or two global currents in two dimensions. The theory is consistent. So in the first, the theory is inconsistent. The second, the theory is consistent, but the current is not conserved. The third, the theory is consistent, and the current is conserved, but there's something subtle, you cannot gauge the current. You cannot couple it to a dynamical field. Or you cannot even couple it to background fields in a gauge invariant way. What we're discussing here is the discrete version of this phenomenon. When people discuss the triangle diagram in three dimensions, in four dimensions, or the bubble with two external legs in two dimensions, they discuss continuous global symmetries. These are symmetries that have net occurrence, so they are or are not coupled to dynamical gauge fields. What we discuss here are things associated with discrete symmetries or with things that are associated with the global part of the group. Before we had this periodicity of the U1, what's the precise periodicity, whether it's 2 pi or 4 pi, and here we have whether the global symmetry is SUN or PSUN. So that's a more subtle thing. If you look locally in the group, you don't see the difference. This is a global thing that tells us what the, the, the group manifold is globally. It might even be a discrete thing when we had this charge conjugation. Right? So the group is a finite group. This is this Z2. They, these symmetries can suffer from all these anomalies, but the description of them is not so simple in terms of this triangle diagram. It's more subtle. And the proper way to think about them is the thing that works in all cases is you try to couple to background fields and you compute the partition function as a function of this background field. This is the recipe that always works. Now, if you try to make it dynamical, you have to make sure that the anomaly, if you don't activate any background field, this phenomenon should not happen. It shouldn't be an anomaly. If some are dynamical, there's kind of a mixed anomaly between dynamical and classical that could affect the classical symmetry. And if they are all classical, the symmetry is not affected, it's still a symmetry, but it leads to this subtle phenomena that we discussed. Ah, so if the U, so I'm writing this formula. This formula makes sense when I can separate the UN field to a U1 part and an SUN part. In that case, I would say, ah, that's the global symmetry, that couples to the global symmetry, and this is the dynamical one. That's a naive thing. I have this system and say A is dynamical. And the fact that there's an index I here, I can add this classical field A that couples it. But there's more to the story because of this PSUN business. Because we can have situations where we are not allowed or we cannot separate the curly A into these two pieces. In other words, the fluxes of A could be fractional if there's something fractional here or if you wish, the transition functions that I use when I define this theory are transition functions in UN, and they might not be transition functions in SUN times U1. Because this, the transition functions do not quite close in this, do not quite close in that, but together they close. The cost cycle condition for one and separate, separately, they, don't, they are not satisfied, but together they are. So that's why this allows me to probe the system in more subtle situations in this Background big gauge, so if the gauge field A is an SUN gauge field, none of that happens. But I have the option of subjecting the system to more subtle A's, which are really PSUN gauge fields. With these gauge fields, if, if I want to do that, I did it without doing any computation, just by writing the Lagrangian using the UN gauge field and deriving this factor of N in the denominator. Another way of saying it is that if this is a U ordinary U1 field, 
its fluxes are always multiples of, of 2 pi. In un, if I try to, to write it like this, then the fluxes of this a could be 1 over n times 2 pi. I can have 1 over n of an instant time. I can have 1 over n of the Dirac monopole. So these are more subtle. So since I can have s smaller fluxes, the periodicity of theta is bigger. Ah, the, in the physical argument, I said that I take these z's and send them to infinity. Now I crank theta up by another 2 pi. I send another z here and z bar there. But by the time I send n of them, these n together give something which is in PSUA. This is an allowed thing so that I can, the, they can transform in the singlet of SUN. They can contract the indices such that they transform in the singlet. So every time I pop one up, I change the analogy by one unit, but the analogy is a mod n thing, and therefore I cannot change more than that. I'm going uh, much, much slower than I planned, which is fine, but okay, I'll just need to readjust. The next topic I'd like to discuss is a little review of Chern Simon's theory in three dimensions. And I'm going to do that only for U1. So I have a U1 gauge field, B, and we've already said that what that means is this is an integer. That's what the U1 gauge field means. So the fluxes are always integers. And we try to write a Chern Simon's Lagrangian. So there's an action. So my convention is that the functional integral is e to the minus the action. So the Chern Simons theory has an i. That's the way it's normally being written. And I have a three manifold M3. And the precise way to write it is in terms of with some M4, where M3 is the boundary of M4. The point is that this way of writing things, it's not clear that it's gauge invariant. In this way of writing things, it is gauge invariant, but it depends on what the theory does in the bulk. So we add the bulk. So it's the same story we had before. This is our M3, and this is our bulk. It could be quite complicated. And this is M4. But now this is a dynamical field. So classical fields, can take values in the bulk, and that's what we call an anomaly. Dynamical fields cannot take value in the bulk, and therefore here we have to insist that the answers are independent of how we extend B to the bulk, and that quantizes K. So very much like what we had before, so K is an integer if we have a spin manifold with the choice of spin structure, And if we want to study non-spin manifolds, K has to be even. So I'm just stating the fact because I don't have time to explain it, and I would rather explain some physics. So this is the Lagrangian. What are the observables? The observables are Wilson lines. So we take a line in our three manifold and we compute the Wilson line going through that line L. And that line has spin that I'm not going to compute. L square over 2k mod 1. Mod 1 is physical, and that's the spin of the line. So the line kind of as if it is rotating, has rotation around, around the line. N square, thank you. So this is Wn, and thank you. From this moment on, any mistake I make on the, on the blackboard, you should blame him because he has not yet corrected me. 
that's WN also. So let's put this in the functional integral. So we have this action, and we have this thing inserted in the functional integral. So let's look at the equation of motion of B. So the equation, we take the, the variation with respect to B, and then we learn that we get K over 2 pi dB. That's what we get from the Lagrangian from here, differentiated with respect to B. And we get 2 pi rather than 4 pi because we have two terms, and there are these i's, and that's equal to n times the delta function along the line L. So think of space-time being this room, that's a three manifold, and the Wilson line goes up, say, this direction, and that means that where it pierces the plane, there is a delta function. What this means is that the field strength, dB, is curvature singularity, which is n over k, and 2 pi. So the insertion of the Wilson line means that there is curvature singularity, or field strength singularity, which is n over k, at the, at the point where we press it. Now, you might not like the delta function, you can replace it by computing the holonomy. So the holonomy around that point, so again, our manifold is this room, the Wilson line goes up here, and at every plane, we're looking at these planes, there's a delta function, field strength, along this line, and that means that there's holonomy as we go around the line, and the holonomy is determined by n over k. The holonomy around it is e to the 2 pi i, n over k. Sorry? Gauss. 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 The holonomy means that I integrate e to the i. This is Gauss law. This is Gauss. This is Gauss law. Gauss law is the variation of the Lagrangian with respect to the gauge field, the equation of motion. Yeah, in the 18th and 19th century, different equations were given different names based on the, the name of the person who first wrote them down. Yeah. Or maybe the credit was not attributed correctly. These days, we think of it as gauge fields, and there's a covariant formulation. And there are two kinds of equations. There's the Bianchi identity and equation of motion. The Bianchi identity tells us that Bf is zero. And the equation of motion is, depends on the Lagrangian, and it is obtained by calculating the variation of the Lagrangian with respect to the gauge field. And that's it. The analogy with four dimensions might actually be confusing here. This is a mathematical fact. It's responsible for many things. It, depending on what, the fractional quantum Hall effect can be presented many different ways. Formula similar to that figure there. I'll soon discuss the fractional quantum Hall effect. Question. So what do we see here? That not all values of n, so not all Wilson line, are distinct. The Wilson line with n and the Wilson line with n plus k have the same holonomy. So you can ask, is the Wilson line with charge n, is it equal or not to the Wilson line with charge n plus k? Because after all, they have the same holonomy around them, and if you cannot go and pierce, look, does it have an n or an n plus k, can you tell the difference? The only thing you can measure is holonomies around them. So they have the same holonomy. Let's check whether they have the same spin. And it's enough for that matter to just substitute n equals zero. So the line wk, is spin k over 2. So if the theory is a non-spin theory, as I said before, k has to be even, and then this line, and everything is mod 1, 
So we can identify n in n plus k. So if k is even, the theory is a non-spin theory. It does not depend on the choice of spin structure. Then the distinct n are 0, 1, up to k minus 1. k different lines. And the others can be identified with them. If, on the other hand, k is odd, we need a choice of spin structure. And then the distinct line, 0, 1, k, k plus 1, k minus, k minus 2k minus 1. So there are two k lines, but they are almost the same. The, the lines with n and n plus k have exactly the same correlation function, but their spins differ by a half. In other words, this line is completely trivial. This is the identity operator. But this line has trivial correlation functions. odd k, I'm continuing with odd k, the line with n equals k is trivial correlation function. And spin, a half, odd one. So the only reason it's non-trivial is that it carries spin. In the applications in condensed matter physics, this is the electron. So there could be all these lines can be thought of as quasi-particles. And as the quasi-particles move through the system, they track a line. They're massive objects. And there could be holonomies as I take one of them around another. And there's this object, which is called the electron. It has trivial correlation functions as it goes around, but it carries spin. So let me give an example. And since I was asked about that, and this is Laughlin's state. Sorry? It, it, because the system we study is a gapped system, so there's nothing at long distances. All we have at long distances are these, this Chern Simons theory, and we have only topological order. The electron just goes through the system. It does not braid with anything. It does not have, does not interact with the, with, with this, but the quasi-particles do interact. They can transform. So let me give an example and that would make it clear, clearer, hopefully. Sorry? Okay, so the Wilson line needs to be regularized. So imagine this is the line. And they're gauge fields, so it interacts, so they're Feynman diagrams. And they're Feynman diagrams, it goes to other lines. But they're also Feynman diagrams like that, coming from self-contractions. Feynman diagrams make the line as if, so how do I deal with such Feynman diagrams? I do point splitting. I say, well, it's not really one line, it looks like two lines, which are next to each other. And the self-contractions are from here to here. So this line looks like a ribbon. And the contractions go from one side to the other. It's called point splitting. Now imagine I take this ribbon and I rotate it by 2 pi. That induces a, a change by a phase. There are many other ways of seeing it, but that's a way of seeing it. Uh, and I just quoted the answer. I, if I had more time, I, would, I could prove it. So as an example, consider u1 level 3. This is the notation. So k is 3. It's odd. It depends on the choice of spin structure. And therefore, there are the following lines. There's the identity with spin zero. We have e to the plus or minus i line integral of b. And its spin is a sixth. 
we have e to the plus or minus 2i b, and its spin is 2 thirds. And we have e to the i 3 integral of b, and its spin is a half. So the quasi-particles in this system usually say that there's one quasi-particle in its inverse. You can think of it as either this or that. And we also have an electron which has trivial correlation function but carries the spin by a half. And therefore, we can say that altogether, we should say that altogether, there are six distinct lines and come in pairs of three and three. The first three are really non-trivial. The other three are essentially the same, but they have different spins. And we are going to refer to this line, the almost trivial line, is a transparent line. The transparent line because we can't see. All we know is that it's somewhere in the system. Where in the system, we can't tell. Because we can move it around and it, does make, it makes no difference. In the remaining, oh, let me take two more minutes and make one more comment. I mentioned before that the U1 gauge field is characterized as an integer. That's for a closed manifold. But then I also said that if I pierce it with a Wilson line, where was it? This is a fossil from a previous discussion. I can have singularities or delta functions which are n over k. But if I put, that tells me that only the state with n equals k is something I can put on a closed sphere. So if I have a closed sphere, I can put only n units of the basic charge. Or, in terms of magnetic charge, the basic thing I can do is put one unit of magnetic flux. So imagine I do the following thing. I take a point out of uh, my manifold, is say R3, or it's embedded in a bigger spring manifold. I take one point out of R3 and I remove it. So now my manifold is R3 minus one point. Now I can surround it by an S2. We can specify boundary conditions on this S2 that the integral of dB with 1 over 2 pi is 1. It's a boundary condition. That's an allowed thing to do. And this is defined as a monopole operator, M. So this is a local insertion. Now, because of the equations of motion and what we discussed before, this is not quite gauge invariant. To make it gauge invariant, we attach a line to it. The line e to the i n b. Now it's gauge invariant, but you could say it depends on the choice of line. But I've already emphasized that this line is a transparent line, so it doesn't matter where this line goes. It only matters whether it has spin a half or not, but this line can go anywhere we want. So this theory also has such monopole operators. That also explains why the correlation functions are what they are, because I can always insert this local operator, and that is not going to affect, and that could be the end of this line. So in the bosonic system, the systems with even k, I can just do that. In the fermionic system, this m is a fermion because it's attached to this fermionic line, but the operator with the square of that is a, is a good operator that we, we can study. Before I finish, I would like to leave you, an, leave you with an exercise. Uh, you don't have to submit it. And even if you submit it, I promise you I'm not going to check it. <laughs> but it's a good exercise. Imagine now Lagrangian is i over 4 pi. So I have a number of fields, bi. And there are coefficients, integers here. And I want you to show that k, i, j all have to be integers. The spin of the line with n, the lines are e to the i, n, i, b, i. And the spin of this thing is one half n, i, a inverse i, j, and j, mod 1, 1, and I want you to find the transparent lines, 
as before, which lines have no holonomy around them, and using their spins, check when the theory does or does not depend on the choice of spin structure. And you have enough information to do that. In the second part of the talk, this thing is blinking. I think I've gone over time. I've gone a little bit faster. And I'd like some feedback of whether the new speed is good or whether I should put the brakes or even go faster. I had more questions at the beginning, which means that the speed was better. Is that K inverse IJ you have written? K is a matrix. Think of K as a matrix. Take the inverse matrix and take of the IJ. IJ element of the inverse matrix. You should be able to prove all that. I gave you enough information to prove it. Okay, so, oh, yep. I don't hear a word. I see your lips moving, but I don't. Sorry, 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 sorry. So in this case, you showed that uh, this U1 representation level N was almost identified with N plus K. So in, in, in the other side, this Oezemino witten theory side, the corresponding statement, is it this related to this modular invariance? In modular invariance. So in the Oezemino witten theory side, the statement that N is ident almost identified with N plus K, what does it correspond to? Oh, 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 I see what you mean. Yes. The answer is yes. Uh -huh. So there's a two-dimensional way of describing this thing, which comes about if we take this system and we put it on the manifold with a boundary. So there's a Katsumudi symmetry on the boundary. And in the Katsumudi symmetry, this thing labels, this N labels the distinct, distinct representation of the Katsumudi algebra on the boundary. I hope this answered your question. And and this identification that N is uh, almost identified with N plus K when K is an even 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 integer. So w what is this statement? That statement in two dimensions is that the operator with N plus K is a descendant of the operator of N. They are in the same model. Okay. Okay. Yes, it answers this. Thank you. Because if you compute the electric charge, here is electric charge. So somebody here asked me about Gauss law. So let's compute Gauss law. It's the variation with respect to B. So if we have this sphere, then there's a delta function of electric charge here. So it's this guy carries electric charge. Here is electric charge K. If it carries electric charge K, eh, I was. That should have been K. Sorry about that. Is this what bothered you? I made a mistake here? No. So if we just look at this thing, the flux is 2 pi. We look at the formula before of the delta function. So imagine all this 2, two pi flux is localized at one point. Then we have exactly the situation we had there. And that is non-trivial electric charge. And the electric charge is K units of charge. So to make it gauge invariant, we attach to it a Wilson line that would correct it. Another way of saying it, if we perform, this is an open Wilson line, it ends at the point. So if we're performing a gauge transformation on it, this is a total derivative. So it gives us k times, times the gauge parameter here. And indeed, these boundary conditions, if you're doing gauge transformation in the, in the, in the Lagrangian, then they would tell you that the gauge transformation will be such that the Lagrangian is also shifted by 2 pi times k times the gauge parameter. So these two exactly cancel each other. 